Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Kristen Baird Adams, member of the City Club's Board of Directors. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Greg Harris, President and CEO of Cleveland's very own Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. To teach, engage, to engage, teach, and inspire through the power of rock and roll is the mission of this iconic institution. And Greg and his extraordinary team, including a number of members gathered here today, do precisely that each and every day, while also generating an estimated $100 million in annual economic impact to our region. Through the power of storytelling, the Rock Hall provides a unique lens through which we can see firsthand how music has shaped our lives, culture, and history. This includes the Rock Hall's latest exhibit, Louder Than Words, which explores the intersection of rock, power, and politics. If you haven't seen it, get there. For those of you with children and grandchildren, bring them. Developed in partnership with the museum in Washington, D.C., where the exhibit will travel in time for the presidential inauguration, Louder Than Words provides a powerful way to connect current events and influences to historic, political, and cultural moments. But the museum is only part of the story. Um, certainly, there are the life-changing educational programs that reach tens of thousands of students, including those most in need across our greater Cleveland community. And then there's the sustained popularity of the Rock Hall induction ceremony, which has brought our community national attention, including the recent announcement that this annual event that traditionally rotated among New York, LA, and Cleveland will now be held in Cleveland every other year beginning in 2018. Uh, you could always say uh, that music has always been in Mr. Harris's blood. His love of music led him to co-found the Philadelphia Record Exchange, a store specializing in rare, used, and independent records, and that store still exists today. He also served as a road manager for musician Ben Vaughn before returning to Temple University to finish his bachelor's degree in American history. In a 2013 interview, Mr. Harris reflected on a turning point in his personal and professional life. Quote, I got really interested in social history, the history of everyday people, and I discovered this thing called folklore. It's oral history, it's economic history, it's why things happen, not just the great battles and great men. That set Mr. Harris on a path toward a PhD program for folklore, which fortunately for all of us, um, he didn't pursue, turning his attention to museum studies in which he obtained a master's degree from the Cooperstown Graduate Program. Mr. Harris subsequently joined the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum as curator of their broadcast collection. He would spend nearly 14 years there in a variety of positions before joining the Rock Hall in 2008 as the Vice President of Development, which is where I first had the opportunity to meet Greg. Mr. Harris was named President and CEO in 2012 after Terry Stewart announced his retirement, making him the sixth person to take the helm of the Rock Hall since 1995. In its 20 year history, the Rock Hall has emerged as an international draw, attracting more than 10 million visitors and an estimated in economic impact of nearly $2 billion uh, to Northeast Ohio during its tenure. What the next 20 years will bring? Well, we're about to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome my good friend, Greg Harris. Thank you, Christine. Fantastic. Thank you, Kristen, very much. And thank you, uh, friends and Clevelanders here that are participating live and also to those across the country that are listening to uh, the, the broadcast and the subsequent streams of it. It's, it's an honor to speak to this August group uh, to know about the 100-year history of this club and to have a chance to, to talk about 
um, the things that our incredible team at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has been doing, as well as the incredible team in the city of Cleveland. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about, just a little bit about where we've been, um, but really focus on where we are right now and then where we're going. Because it speaks to what is the museum of the future, it speaks to what happens to these cultural institutions in times of great change, and what happens to a museum that's dedicated to an art form that's always evolving, always changing, and it's always pushing, and in, in ways we have to do the same thing. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is now 21 years old. Think about that. I guess it's legal. <laughs> it's come of age. Can, can have a, a cocktail now and then. And um, this is a, a place that, you know, just let's talk about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It, it's a history museum with the artifacts that tell the story of our history, but it's also an art museum. Think about that. It's an art museum and a history museum. It's a place where the artifacts and the music have always been the stars, but really the stars are our collective memories that those artifacts and music spark. That's the stars. That's what happens every day in our museum. It's a place where every single person has a different definition of the quality of the art form that we preserve and celebrate. In fact, they have a different definition of what is rock and roll. Everybody. You know, in case you're wondering, it's not just for skinny guys with long hair and guitars. It's hip hop, it's dance music, it's heavy metal, it's doo wop, it's beach music, it's soul music. It's all under this big umbrella in this big tent. The other thing is that there are universals for all successful businesses, and, and we're applying those, you know, focusing our energy on our customers, focusing on the experience focusing on being a great collaborator, working with great partners. And um, that's where the exponential growth comes and the success comes. We're working um, at present, like any good business should, with a strategy, with a plan. We're using insight through data, and we have a very talented and committed staff. And when you have all those pieces, success follows. And so to frame where we're going, let's take a look back and sort of where the museums come. Kristen. Uh, summarized a few of our highlights, and I'm going to just touch on a few others, and then we'll talk about today. Um, overall, in, in addressing a group of Clevelanders, and hopefully Clevelanders that are participating on the stream and others, uh, every chance we get, we need to thank this community. This community mobilized. This community wanted this museum. Um, there was a lot of work that happened to attract it, and uh, there was a big, big gamble to fund, pay for, and create this place. And one of the things as I stand here after 21 years, 21 short years, the promise that Cleveland made to the rest of the world in doing this, it's been upheld. Close to 11 million visitors. When you roll up the economic impact, it's over $2 billion in economic impact over those 21 years. Phenomenal. We've served nearly 500,000 school children at our museum. And we don't teach them the history of rock and roll. We teach them math science, social studies, all through the prism of rock and roll. We've hosted 15 years of a program called Toddler Rock, and that's where students from, young children from local Head Start programs come to the museum. They spend um, two days a week for 13 weeks, and they don't learn how to write songs or play instruments. They learn rhyming, alliteration, and social skills all through the prism of rock and roll. It's a wonderful program that we do in conjunction with University Hospital, the Beck Center for the Art, uh, for the Arts, the Council for Economic Opportunities, and our great friends at PNC. Um, it's phenomenal. We are now, again, in our 15th year of this program. To step back, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has truly become an emblem for this city. Think about it. The, the grit, the tenacity, the authenticity that, that matters so much for a place called the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, for an art form called Rock and Roll, that's Cleveland. And it was nowhere more evident than when the local, when the Republican National Convention was in town. Think about that logo. Um, I can't think of any other city that could pull off a logo with an electric guitar and, and an elephant for the Republican National Convention, and, and we did. Um, so, you know, today the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is a vibrant organization. Um, as we've said, we're staffed well. We have an incredible team. We have a phenomenal board. Many board members are here today. Thank you, trustees. Um, and, uh, you know, we have great partners, the city of Cleveland, the state of Ohio, the county, 
is our partner. Destination Cleveland has been an incredible partner. The Downtown Cleveland Alliance, the Greater Cleveland Partnership, the CAC is terrific. There's plenty of other foundations, corporations, and other civic partners. And then we have other museum partners. Kristen talked about collaborating with the Newseum, terrific museum in Washington, D.C., that is uh, considered one of the most technology-driven, forward-focused museums in the world. And we're partnering with them on this latest exhibit that I'm going to talk about. But we have traveling exhibits that are out at partner museums right now around the country. And we're actively working with partners like the Smithsonian Institution on a major exhibit that's coming in the next couple of years. Um, that, that's what makes the work we do so much easier, and it makes it all so much better. Now, what drives us each day? Uh, Kristen mentioned our mission, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restate the mission. That's our external face. And then I want to share our vision statement. That's our internal driver. But our mission is to engage, teach, and inspire through the power of rock and roll. To engage, teach, and inspire through the power of rock and roll. And then our vision, which is what drives our team, is to broaden our reach. We're not happy staying where we are. We want to broaden our reach. We want to continue to grow through meaningful connections with visitors, fans, artists, and each other. And as I talk about what we're doing, the meaningful connections is really one of the most important pieces, and the other is, is broadening our reach. Um, since 1995, when we opened, think about what's changed in your lives. How do you acquire music? Uh, what do you use to communicate with your friends and family? Uh, how do you do business? Um, 95, I'm not sure there were smartphones kicking around. Uh, I remember a, a pager uh, <laughs> that, that you could sort of click on. And uh, I think um, offices would have a cell phone that people could take home if there was an emergency. Um, but it's, we've evolved. It's really incredible we've evolved. And it's wonderful for a museum uh, to have the technology and the evolution at its disposal. So back then, it was kind of special to go to a place where you could see footage of Chuck Berry, where you could see footage of the Beatles, where you could see footage of Jimi Hendrix, uh, where you could see these things. Now you can see it on YouTube, you know, sitting at your kitchen counter uh, with a cup of coffee. You can see it on your phone. Uh, so those pieces are, were very important elements. As we move forward, we need to think about what, the, what are the important elements for the future. <clears throat> as, a, as a business, we've had real steady periods of predictable attendance. Uh, which is a solid testament uh, to, the, to the organization and to the region. At the same time, we've had growing expenses. And clearly, as a business, you want to keep rolling and keep growing. So in the last two years, we've really amped it up. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that we've experienced double-digit growth over the last two years. Uh, and attendance is our, one of our biggest metrics in other, um, in other areas. We're really on a wonderful roll. And the, the reason why. so. First and foremost, uh, at its core, is we, we dug deep to understand our customers better than ever. We know our customers incredibly well. Our marketing team, our others, dug deeply to understand who are they, who's coming, why are they coming, and why aren't they coming. And we were likely the first museum uh, in the country and maybe the world to actually add a director of strategy and analytics to our team. Uh, we did that about two and a half, three years ago. Um, the very first place to do that. And we're using this to create a culture where we're making a lot of our decisions, not solely on it, but really looking at data-driven decisions and using that to pair it with our audience segmentation work to understand our customers. You know, using that has helped us refocus our customer experience. Um, and underneath it all, we've had such positive pickup that we've also inspired some of the people in our world um, there is a very recent um, planned gift of a couple million dollars uh, that is there just to improve our customer experience. People believe in this when you're doing it with a discipline and when you're showing results. That gift won't be realized for quite a while. We hope the person is, is with us a long, long time, but the, the investment and testament is strong. So one of our key tenets in looking at these visitors, what are they open to hearing? Not just what we want to tell them. What are they open to hearing? Are they ready to listen to it? Is it the right format? Is it the right time? One of the things we heard loud and clear in our research and, um, is that our number one complaint was you couldn't take photos in our museum. Not surprising. You couldn't take photos in most museums four or five years ago. And that was a legacy that existed for as long as photography existed. 
um, you were prohibited from taking photographs. The difference was, after the 90s, we were all carrying around a, a camera, and it's how we were telling people what we were doing and where we were and how we were experiencing the world. And so we looked at it, and again, other museums were, were wrestling with, with this at the same time, um, but we made a quick decision uh, back in 2014, 2013, after analyzing it to lift the ban. And it changed our experience in the museum. Our wonderful staff, who was charged with policing that, were doing a great job. But you were essentially telling almost every visitor, you can't do that, you can't do that, as opposed to, hi, welcome, uh, can I help you? Uh, why don't I take a photo? The other thing that it helped us do is it allowed us to unleash this thing where we could tell 400,000 visitors a year, tell your friends about us. Share this, share the experience and connect and, and make things happen. So a very small thing, but had massive impact in our world. And other museums are, are following it and are doing the same thing. And I'm guessing there probably isn't a museum in the world right now that restricts it, although there may be. Um, so that was one piece. The other piece was that we need to move from static exhibits to a more dynamic form of storytelling. Whenever possible, we want the artists to speak in their own words. We started doing um, special interviews with artists and, in, and using them in the exhibitions more. Uh, we're looking much harder at our archival collection, at our library and archive, and how do you integrate those things in the exhibits more. And the goal is really to focus on creating more immersive experiences, bringing it to life, and having the artist in their own words. The other piece of that is in the storytelling narrative, we want to connect yesterday with today. We want to make sure that if you're talking about Bruno Mars, you're connecting Bruno Mars to Michael Jackson, to Elvis Presley, to the people that he admires and his influences. And we could use those examples with every single artist. And when you do that well, it connects generations. So um, the other piece of this is that our, it's rock and roll. To be true to our brand, we have a freedom to be messy. We have a freedom to push it a little bit and to be a little rough around the edges, but to do it well. And um, to be a bit disruptive. And one of the things about rock and roll is it's a feeling. And if you do it right, you're, you're doing, we're serving the mission better. We can better engage. We can better inspire. So, you know, I want to talk about a few things that we did right away and then paint a picture of, of as you approach the museum now to see those changes in action and then to think about where we're going. So these were um, some recent major commitments, mainly through partners and, and other investments. But, you know, we want to start this whole journey not at the museum down 9th Street. It starts at home, so a new website. And one of our donors felt strongly about this and helped make that happen. Go to our website and take a look at it. Um, we took a, a site that had a lot of information. We went from 17,000 pages down to under 1,000 pages. And in doing that, we had to tighten up the story. We had to make sure that if you see one photo of Aretha Franklin, it's the best photo of Aretha Franklin possible because we are the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So look at that. We, we really tightened that up. Um, we, we worked on another great local partnership. It was the Rock Box Project that uh, the Clevelanders here will know about. Um, these great massive speaker towers that are on Rock and Roll Boulevard down 9th Street in Cleveland. And the idea is to connect downtown with the museum and the museum with downtown. Um, yeah, that was Destination Cleveland was a real partner and Land Studios was a real partner for that. The other piece is for this immersive experience. Again, we're not at the building yet. Our plaza on the front of the building has to be part of that experience. And we've installed a seasonal stage. And the goal is when people are walking to the, up to the museum in the summertime, they hear live music coming from that stage. It creates the experience, it creates the vibe. That live music could be a, a band that's on tour that has an off day or it could be kids from the local school of rock performing. Um, but having live music creates that environment. Then uh, once you're in, in the museum now, what used to be fairly stark, white, beautiful IMP design spaces, uh, we've injected some color into them. Uh, there are massive, um, bold graphics in, in this previously stark space. And then the exhibits, once you get into them, they're contextual exhibits that we want to be more than just Encyclopedic, we want to provide that context and that connection and really bring it home. So let me walk you through a journey today. Ideally, you go to our new website, 
wherever you are, those again that are, li that are listening out outside of Cleveland. And you might see a video clip of Chuck D from Public Enemy talking about the power of music as a voice of social change in conjunction with our Louder Than Words Rock and Politics exhibit. It would be a unique interview that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame conducted with him that he was enthusiastic about doing because he's one of our inductees and loves the subject. You may see one of our traveling exhibits at a partner museum. We talked about the museum. Um, it could be the museums at Stony Brook out of Long Island. It could be the Texas History Museum in Austin where our festival's exhibit is going. But you'll see one of our exhibits. You may just be consuming our social feeds that are coming out of the museum or doing research at our library catalog, which is online and searchable. Whatever it is, it sparks you to bring your family to Cleveland. Maybe you pair it with an Indians game, a Cavs game, or a Browns game, who knows. And you stay at one of our great new hotels in town, one of our refurbished ones. You leave the hotel and you walk down 9th Street and you hear the rock box art installations fire up and it's Stevie Wonder, it's the Beach Boys, uh, who knows what it is. And as you approach the building, you're enveloped by a live band on our plaza. It's pulling you in. And if it's not a live band, maybe it's 2,000 people practicing yoga to a rock and roll soundtrack, which is happening later this month, by the way. You enter the building, there's massive photo murals. There's Springsteen, there's Mavis Staples, B.B. King, David Bowie, Prince, and you hear audio through the speakers. When you go up to our line, you go to our membership line because you bought your membership before you left home, right? <laughs> and, and then you enter our exhibits. And let's start you with Louder Than Words, Rock, Power, and Politics. The first thing you see is a singular case. And in that case is a single guitar. It's Jimi Hendrix's guitar. But it's actually the guitar. Behind it, there's a screen. And Hendrix is performing with that guitar. And you realize he's on stage at Woodstock playing the national anthem with that actual guitar that you're standing next to. And at that moment, it's a chance to talk about what did Woodstock mean? What did it mean to be an American at that point in time to play the most um, patriotic of songs in a circumstance with 200,000 plus, 200, plus people questioning what it meant? You go further into the exhibit, and you learn that a few years earlier, on the day Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, he was preceded at the dais by Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, Josh White, Odetta, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the stories there. Across the gallery, sort of the bookend this, is today's Voices of Change. In the same exhibit is Kendrick Lamar, Beyonce, Bono, talking about music as a social force. Next to that, you can see the original lyrics from the German heavy metal band, The Scorpions. And the song is The Winds of Change. And it was the soundtrack in Eastern Europe as the Berlin Wall came down and as the Soviet republics opened up. That's on exhibit right now. Rock and roll is the voice of freedom around the world. So these, to me, are incredibly meaningful connections. And that's what we want to do. It's not about volume. It's about going deep, having that story, making those connections. Let's finish the visit. You enjoy the museum. You pause for a drink on our plaza, and you share your communal table with visitors from, they could be from any of all 50 states, they could be from one of 100 foreign countries. You share stories about your favorite concerts, your favorite songs, and you find common ground. That's happening right now at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So engaging, teaching, inspiring through the power of rock and roll and making meaningful connections through this music. Thank you very much. Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum with Greg Harris, President and CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. We're about to begin the Q&A session and welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or even news live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it to at City Club and our staff will work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point and actually questions. Hello, Greg. Uh, you know who I am. I know who you are. <clears throat> I have a question uh, about the Louder Than Words exhibit. Uh, you mentioned uh, 
the screen with Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner uh, at Woodstock. I'd like to know, is there any interest in the Rock Hall connecting with uh, my dear friend Artie Kornfeld, who was the co-creator of Woodstock? Uh, he has been at the Rock Hall uh, on a visit in 2010 when he was doing a lecture at Akron University. Uh, Th thank you um, very much for that question. And the, the good news is we're approaching a big anniversary. The 60th anniversary of Woodstock is in, in 2019. And we want to work with anybody associated with it, with Michael Lang, with, with folks like Artie. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Greg, thank you for your leadership here in Cleveland and what you're doing at the Rock Hall. Um, what project are you most excited about that you can share with the public in 2017, for example? OK. Um, some of the changes to our physical spaces are, are quite exciting. And, and they connect to things that we're doing virtually. Um, on an operational side, you know, we're shifting our food service from the third floor to the first floor. That frees up the whole floor to become our Hall of Fame floor. And we're looking really closely at our exhibition hall for the inductees. Right now, it's a, it's a theater that you've probably been in. It has three giant screens. It's about an 18-year-old show, and it runs over two hours long. So you see a little bit of every inductee. Uh, we want to make that a far more immersive experience, a tighter experience that brings forth the emotions of rock and roll. And that's one of our most exciting projects. Uh, we'll be working on that over the winter. Um, we are, uh, we're excited about it. We have the support uh, to move forward, and it will be a major transformation of the museum. Um, right now, we're hearing that it will be done sort of mid-summer, and we're working very diligently. It will also give us a chance, the reason why it ties to other things we're doing, is within our archives. We have 31 years worth of induction ceremonies. And right now, um, we haven't unleashed them in our spaces yet or in our on, online and other places to the extent we feel that we can. We have a large oral history collection that's the same way. First and foremost, we're going to mine our own assets to tell that story and, and have them come out and see the light of day. And what, in doing so, it's forcing a discipline of making sure all those pieces are digitized, cataloged, and available so they can then populate other things we're doing. So that's one of the bigger initiatives. Um, hi, Greg. Um, not a hard question. Being on the board, we um, have always been very proud of the uh, library and archives. And maybe we can give the audience a little more insight as to what we do there. Sure. Thank you, Jules. Um, by the way, one of our great, great board members, not the, at the exclusion of others sitting here, not at all, but Jules, um, Jules uh, Belkin is so responsible for all the, the many of the great things hap that have happened in Cleveland through rock and roll, uh, Jules, so thank you. Uh, and thanks for the question about the library and archives. Um, just a short um, uh, jaunt from here, uh, probably a mile or less away on the campus of, of Tri-C is the, is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's library and archives. And it's, in essence, a, a presidential library where everything there is related to rock and roll. So it has recordings. It has original manuscript collections from some of the, um, the, the major music executives, uh, the launching of Atlantic Records, uh, Clive Davis's collection, things like that. Uh, it also has all of this content I mentioned, uh, 31 years worth of induction footage, um, lots of photos, an oral history collection. It's available for scholars to come and do research and to, to, to sort of camp out there and write books, and they do it quite regularly. Um, the other piece of the library is they, the library team has this content, and they are information um, and preservation specialists, and they are the ones that are cataloging it so that we can use it through our social media, through our exhibitions, through the other things we're doing at the museum. And that's why some of the things that we're doing with technology in the museum are possible. Uh, it's a wonderful place. There are author programs over there. Students come in and use um, the library and archives. And uh, as we move forward, we talked about a little bit of museums in, in change mode. Libraries are in a change mode in a very, very massive way. Uh, where are people getting their content? Where are they getting their information? And how are these spaces being used? And we're looking at our library and archive as a major public resource, but also as a really important resource for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame internally as a museum because the people that are 
that are um, staffing it are experts in preservation, experts at access, and experts, experts at making things available. Uh, so it, it's a very important part of our world, Jules, and I, I appreciate you asking about it. Hi. First, a brief thank you for serving our East Cleveland children at the Rock Hall. And uh, the question is, what are you doing, planning, thinking about for continuation and expansion of the programs for school children? Mm -hmm. So the local school programs, I'll, I'll talk about first, and I want to talk about sort of nationally. Uh, locally, we continue, we have an unbelievable um, uh, education team on our staff. They create curriculum materials that align with the state standards and then schools from all over Northeast Ohio come and participate in the programs. Any CMSD class that comes, it's free. Furthermore, we underwrite the buses to get them there. We have a really strong commitment to making sure. How about East Cleveland? Are you CMSD? No, oh. East Cleveland. Gotcha. Um, in that case, if you're within the zip codes for uh, 440, and there's a few zip codes, I'm, I'm confident that it's free for them as well. Um, they come, they learn, again, math, science, social studies, things like that in our museum. And we're gonna continue those programs. They're vital, they're important. Our staff does a terrific job and the, the surveys that we send back to teachers and students have come back just off the charts on the impact of these. Outside of this region, we have a, a digital learning initiative. It used to be that schools would video conference into Cleveland with a teacher in a class and we could accommodate at its height about 9,000 students a year doing that. And that's what we were doing. Well, schools are now getting away from video conferencing, much like any corporate entity, and it all is coming through a stream and or a, a download that isn't specifically based on a certain time and a certain moment that you can pull it whenever you need it and use it. So our team has regrouped and they've created curriculum materials that we're posting online for teachers to pull down at any time to use them for students to pull down on their own and use them. And uh, these pieces, we, we did it in a very um, strategic way. We had a group of teacher advisors from across the country that piloted the program. We refined the curriculum. We put it out as a, uh, as a test uh, for an amount of time. And we're currently analyzing that test and going back out to market um, with something new and impactful. There's a smaller version of it that we've left up right now. But as this school year kicks in, expect to see more things out there. And by doing that, we scale this from those that can just have a video conference rig and talk to one teacher at one moment to having the ability uh, for hundreds and thousands of classes to use it at one time, whenever they need it, wherever they need it. Okay, let me, uh, let me also thank you for the services that you provide for students. Uh, last year, uh, Issue 8 was passed, which was passed to provide money to enhance the arts in Cuyahoga County. Uh, so often we, we vote for issues and then we never get to hear about how the money is being used. So could you just talk about how Issue 8 was able to uh, help the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame do the things that you do? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's very important funding, and one of the, the tenets of, of that funding is to provide, you know, great experiences, arts experiences for people in Northeast Ohio, in this region. Um, one for enrichment, but also just to enhance the quality of life, to help in, with it being a, a well-established and a, and a solid community to attract great talent, great businesses, and other growth. Um, those funds support the museum and how we create programs. We do a number of community festivals every year, a number of community programs. Uh, there are days where we open up our museum um, free to the public and we host uh, eight, 10,000 people at one time. Those funds make it possible for us to do those things. Um, they also uh, help fuel things like we've talking about education and other public programs. They go hand in hand uh, at the museum. And so we're, we're thrilled to join so many of the other museums and nonprofits in Northeast, Northeast Ohio uh, receiving those funds. We're thrilled that the levy was renewed uh, so that we can continue uh, doing the programs that we're doing and keeping it up. And um, the, the impact measures from that funding um, are, are very, very uh, remarkable. And we continue to, to be sort of value that support and, and use it wisely so that we can impact Northeast Ohio. Hey, Greg. Hey, Liv. Um, thanks for sharing just uh, how pioneering the Rock Hall was in bringing on leadership to lead the analytics 
work that you referred to. You've also been a pioneer in bringing on technology leadership to the Rock Hall. Could you just say a little bit about what technology leadership has meant to the efforts at the Rock Hall? Thank you, Lev. Um, you know, there's a shift that you make in your, in your entities, your business entity, when it's no longer network support and sort of business operation. And in the museum world, there's this blending of the concept of the audiovisual and the, the full-on sort of digital IT backbone stream. And historically, there's been different people for audiovisual and different people for technology. And frequently, um, they haven't crossed. Uh, we took the opportunity. Uh, we identified a, a real need to bolster our, our group beyond just the network infrastructure. And we established a standalone technology division and did a, a strong search and, and landed on an incredible individual uh, to become our vice president of technology. And he came to us from the science museum world. And science museums are ahead of history museums. Uh, using technology to create immersive experiences, um, using technology uh, to, to reach wide audiences and immersive exhibits. And the person that we brought on, well, he's sitting here, Mark Check. I'm talking about you in the third person while you're here, um, really brought a, a wonderful background uh, from world-class museums and then took that and is layering it on to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and could not have arrived at a better time as we talk about digital learning as we talk about driving our library and archives and using this strong digital backbones to feed other things that we're doing. Uh, since arriving a year ago, uh, we've been building uh, Mark's team with people like digital asset managers um, and front end developers so that we can be responsive and we can, we can build these things. And truly what's represented in our digital world mirrors what I shared with you in our physical spaces. We need to have that uh, to the rest of the world. And that doesn't come easy. All those pieces have to work along the way. So he has a big role. His department has a big role. Um, and we would be in trouble without this department. So thank you, Lev. Greg, in the beginning, as they say, the uh, leadership of the music industry in New York had a major involvement and role in the rock and roll creation and so forth. What role do you have, or what role does, the, does that group have today? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. You know, over the last 21 years, the music industry has changed dramatically. Um, but as an institution, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, is a museum here in Northeast Ohio that has all the elements we talked about. There's another entity that's known as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation. That group was chartered about 34 years ago, and for 31 years has been running the induction ceremony. That is the group that provided the license rights to Cleveland to, to build, operate, and have this museum. And uh, as um, Mr. Pogue uh, referred, re referenced, that foundation was heavily um, music industry people. Um, they um, were very, very involved. Some of the big record labels, uh, some of the bigger magazines were very involved. And early on, um, they had involvement with the museum and helped fund projects that were happening and were actively involved. Um, we're still actively involved. Um, they are a group that um, we now have um, board members sitting on both boards so that we have some cross-pollination. Um, when I talked about this, this amazing uh, exhibition uh, for our, our theater, the immersive theater that we're going to be working on, they're providing the leadership funding for that immersive theater. And, um, and that is a, a very strong investment and a vote of confidence in where we're going as an institution and, and what we mean to the city. Uh, that same group of individuals were central to our discussions and our um, negotiating and our agreement to, to have the inductions here every other year. And that came about because, again, um, we're showing great success. Uh, we have uh, comfort in, in assuming these projects, and, and they've been a great partner on making that happen again, starting in 2018. The inductions will be here 18, 20, 22, 24. And so that's how it's come together. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very positive, healthy relationship. I remember being impressed when the museum 
first came into existence, that the central theory for bringing things, memorabilia, scripts, guitars, everything that people would love to see and as real live artifacts, bringing them into the museum, the theory was focused on lending rather than buying, which struck me as deeply wise because you could have inadvertently made things scarce that you wanted to make widely available. But I wonder how that theory is playing out over the decades. And perhaps you can tell us some stories about how you get people to lend valuable things rather than selling them, mm -hmm. or rather than giving them to some other museum. Yes. Uh, and there are some other competing museums now that you have to fight with or struggle with to get loans. So please tell me about that side of the whole theory of the museum. Absolutely. Um, even with so much that we're talking about immersion in technology and other pieces, at, its, at our core, we need great artifacts. You know, that Hendrix guitar is a vital piece to tell the story that we just told and have that impact. So there's a piece that I, I want to add to your listing of opportunities. You mentioned buying, getting loans, um, and um, that others may. That is gifting. Our, our highest purpose is to have the artifact owner donate it to the museum. And if that isn't possible, to have a donor that may negotiate something fair and then donate it to the museum. To step back, the, the museum collection numbers, and I, I need to, I believe the museum collection at this point, if you don't count the library and archives, it, it, it's over 5,000 artifacts, of which at any given time, five or 600 are on exhibit. The lion's share of what we have, we own, and we didn't buy. There's another slippery slope here with museums. When museums are knowingly buying things, then the market changes for those things, and you sort of compete with yourself. So we own most of what we have, but many of the best things we have, we don't own. And some, they're on loan. And some of that is a circumstance of, of who's loaning them, who owns them. Uh, anybody here that's a Bruce Springsteen fan knows that great Fender guitar that he breaks out. We had a Bruce Springsteen exhibit a couple years ago. He loaned us that guitar. It was central to the exhibit. When he was playing a show in South America, wherever it was, we shipped him the guitar <laughs> so he could plug it in. You know, My point of reference is frequently the sports museums having been at the Baseball Hall of Fame for almost 15 years. And in that world, at least at baseball, everything's donated. There's a real strong nuance, though. In baseball, when something of that magnitude happens, there's a lot of different items that, that connect to it, whether it's the balls, the gloves, the hat. You know, So you, you want something from a, a key moment. You don't just want things. The other thing is there was a legacy there that people started donating stuff in 1938 and continued. And the final piece is when you think about it as Hall of Fame inductees and items. So the Springsteen example is a tangible example. Sport, athletes retire from what they're being enshrined for. Musicians don't. So musicians are still performing. They're still pulling from the same gear. Uh, they're still pulling the same things. And, and so there's a really important distinction that some of those best items, that's what happens to them. The other thing. They're not retired. Their fortunes change, right? Uh, they can be up, down, sideways. And frequently, musicians have certain charities that they support, and they do it by their donations. Elton John uh, supports age-related charities, and that's where his artifacts are, are auctioned for. Um, Eric Clapton supports uh, some other types of charities, and, and that's where their artifacts go. So there's a funny competition. Now to step back. One of the key things that, that we do as a museum to help foster this is whenever artists are touring, whenever they're nearby, we want to get them to the museum. We want them to see what it's all about, see where they fit into this legacy. And incidentally, when an artist comes in the museum, there's a quick check to see if any of their stuff is there <laughs> by them and us. But mainly, they want to see the people that inspired them. 
they're in this business, they're, they're, they've dedicated the life to it, they, they did what they had to do as teens and 20 year olds with practice to become great at something because they were inspired by somebody. So when they're in the museum, when Paul Simon's in the museum, he wants to see Everly Brothers stuff because that's what he listened to. Uh, when Slash is in the museum, he wants to see, you know, the guys from Led Zeppelin's, John Paul Jones's bass. He wants to see, um, you know, um, Robert Plant's things. He wants to see the stuff that inspired him and Jimmy Page's guitar. And what happens after those tours, at the end, somewhere in the, that, that tour, you ask, what, what should we have of yours to tell your story for the next 50 years, the next 100 years, the next 500 years? And I'm thrilled to stand here and use that Slash example as a perfect one. One of his original Les Pauls that he used in Guns N' Roses um, the first few years uh, was shipped uh, shortly after that with a signed gift agreement, complete donation. Um, I traveled back late Friday night um, from San Francisco uh, transporting a guitar that was donated by um, the guitarist for the iconic, influential Hall of Fame inductees uh, Iggy Pop's band, The Stooges, and it was one that was used for recordings that impacted, you know, hundreds and hundreds of other bands for the next 20 years, gifted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So we're making progress on that front. We do own a lot of what's there. Those that were there before us made progress as well. But there is this funny um, piece of what we do and how we collect, and it's very different, I think, than collecting paintings you know, that have, they're, they're in, they're commerce. They're out in the world. We're collecting this stuff right from the people that are using these tools and they're still, still active, most of them. Great question. Good afternoon. Um, the special exhibits at the Rock Hall, especially in the, the ground or underground floor, add such a depth of field to the permanent collection. And I wondered if you might speak on any genres or aspects of rock and roll that might be underrepresented and maybe what we might be seeing um, broadening that representation in special exhibits to come. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, it, louder than words, rock power and politics was, was one of those. Um, you know, you can, to find things that can be framed in a broader social context uh, that are stories that have, have existed for, for generations and that have really sharp contrast and great comparables, uh, that's, that's one of the keys. Um, to have the happy circumstance of pairing that exhibition theme, which by the way was on our exhibit themes list for a couple years, but to do it this summer when the political spotlight was on our, our state and our city, um, just amped it up even more. Uh, other exhibits, you know, on that same list, uh, there's exhibits that are exploring gender and identity and, um, and where rock and roll has had a voice and where rock and roll has been um, a, a place uh, for, for people to gather and to feel um, comfortable and to feel open. You frequently hear, um, People talk about rock and roll as, and I'll give you an example, um, a, a great friend of the museum uh, grew up in, in Hungary. Uh, he was the Hungarian ambassador to the United States later on in, in life. But he said being there in the 60s, um, when their country was all sort of black and white and shut down, he would hear Radio Free Europe and he would hear Steve Winwood in traffic and he would hear you know, rock and roll music. And what it did for him is he realized that there was tens of thousands of people the exact same as age as him in other parts of the world listening to the exact same thing and feeling the exact same you know, euphoria, heartbreak, loss, and it enabled him to connect with the whole world. And maybe that's why he went on to do what he did. But there's that connection. And you frequently hear it from our artists that you know, those that are questioning um, uh, anything, they find a like-minded voice. Uh, in that music and it connects with them. So expect to see that as an exhibit uh, coming forward. You know, we do have some of the, um, in creating an exhibit frequently, there are iconic artist individuals and others. So I'll go back to, um, you know, the Bruce Springsteen exhibit. It wasn't just to show his stuff. It was to talk about Bruce Springsteen and his vision of the American dream 
and frame it in the right context. So we are still going to do artist-themed exhibits. Um, frequently, those exhibits allow us to have you know, an aggregate of artifacts that we can tell a story with. But the goal isn't just to talk about how great they are. It's to put them into the social context and the, and the broader cultural context and how it works together. Um, you know, as I look at our list of exhibits going forward and the list that we've had, um, you know, the political one was big. Uh, gender it is big. Um, there are clearly um, things with rock and roll on the global scale as that voice of freedom from that story I shared. Um, rock and roll has always had a racial story that's really uh, core uh, to, to rock and roll music. In fact, it's told a little bit in, our, in Louder Than Words. And somebody was walking through Louder Than Words and they looked at each section. They said every one of these sections could be its own exhibit. Um, that is really great fodder for, um, for thought and great fodder for inspiration as we build things. What, uh, what is being done to further outreach to international visitors who might be encountering a language barrier? You know, we do have, and it's, it's not the greatest answer in the world to that question, but we have print guides in a number of languages that we provide to them. Um, we have not translated our website into these languages yet. Uh, we were going to do the quickie translator, and what we learned is that doesn't work. Not for a world-class museum, uh, it does not work. Um, it's a timely question because roughly, is it 10% of our visitors' time are, are international. Now, a big slug of them are from Canada. But even there, you have a bilingual um, country. So at, the, at present, they are print guides to the museum exhibition that we update each season and that we make available to visitors. And we promote that we do that. Uh, down the road, expect to see something digital that's much broader. And the other piece that may be imp implied in that question is what are we doing to go from Cleveland out to the rest of the world? And one of those pieces is our traveling exhibitions that we want to have our traveling exhibitions travel and go to great museums in other parts of the world, and that we're actively working on, on partnerships to, to help us do that. Hey, Greg. Um, I'm curious, early in your speech, I thought you mentioned something about partnering with the Smithsonian mm -hmm. on an exhibit. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that might be? Sure. Um, it, it's actually a three-way partnership with the Smithsonian and the Grammy Museum. And um, it's, it's a bit of a ways off. These are, it's a pretty massive exhibit that will open at the Smithsonian first. And it's part of their new initiative in the American History Museum at the Smithsonian. Um, they're going heavy on sports and entertainment to tell the story of America. And this is a real central piece. Uh, I believe the sports galleries are open. This will be the bigger entertainment piece of it. Remember, they're the place with Archie Bunker's chair and, Judy and uh, the red shoes from Wizard of Oz. Well, we're, we're going to inject some rock and roll there. Um, but, um, but we're working on it. It's, it's a broad survey, quite frankly, um, of a look at, at rock and roll, how it reflects and shapes culture, and has done so over the last 60 years, and has real topical elements, any of which of these topical elements could be uh, standalone exhibits at some point. Uh, so rock and roll and the rise of teen culture uh, would be one. Um, but that's a very exciting exhibit. I'm sure there will be, you know, press and other pieces will, will follow, but I don't think you're going to hear anything about it for uh, at least um, a year, is my guess, on the broader media side. But we've been working with them for over a year now, and uh, it's, it's moving along really, really well. Uh, but uh, we don't have things to unveil until we get it, uh, get things to unveil. <laughs> Greg, thanks so much for joining us here. And you know, as a, a fan of free speech and rock being perhaps America's most pure expression of free, free speech, I'm glad to, that we could host you today. Um, in response to Mr. Pogue's question, you talked a little bit about the relationship between the Rock and the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Hall of Fame Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could demystify for us the induction process, the voting process, and also connected to that is, uh, is also how you choose the American Music Masters. And congratulations on a really wonderful selection of Johnny Cash. Big fan. Fantastic. Well, that's why I'm wearing black. Uh, 
so the, uh, the induction process, I'm, I'm glad you framed it that way because there is some mystery out in the wider market about it, and there really shouldn't be. Let, let me try and walk you through uh, how the election happens. Uh, first and foremost, and I'll use a baseball analogy, it has nothing to do with statistics. You don't need to win you know, 300 games or have 3,000 hits. or um, You don't need to sell a certain number of records. You don't need to have a certain number of gold records. First, and f the, the primary criteria for consideration is, was it impactful and influential? Did you take the art form in a new direction? The other single hard and fast rule is you had to have made a recording at least 25 years earlier. So there's a bit, uh, there's perspective over time. Uh, that's to be eligible. Then the way the process works is there's a group of people, roughly, it's called the nominating committee, and it's approximately 24 people. It's a face-to-face -face meeting. Everybody in the meeting is able to nominate two. And you go around the room, and people put forth their nominations. Obstensively, you could end that with we have there, uh, 48 people, but frequently people endorse others. So that room has an open discussion, very collegial. And nobody disparages other people's picks. And when you leave the room, you've done a series of balloting to come up with 15 people on the ballot. Now, those in the room, there are musicians. Um, there are inductees. There are historians. There are scholars. That's who's in the room. Uh, music historians, music critics, and that ballot's created. That ballot of 15 is usually done around September or so, and it gets released to the public. That ballot then goes out to roughly 700 other voters. The 700 other voters, the, the biggest block are all the other living inductees. We have 310 inductees, groups too, so if you think of all the members in certain bands that you love, Every member of the E Street Band gets a vote. Um, they go out. That's the single largest voting body. That is augmented by some of these scholars, historians, writers. Uh, in addition, there's a fan vote that's posted online, and, and, fa and fans vote, um, much like the Heisman Trophy does the same thing in you know, the All-Star Game for baseball. Uh, when all those come back, the top five vote getters, historically the top five, are elected to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then they're the ones that are part of the ceremony and part of um, what happens. But to step back, that single largest voting body, the reason why the inductees vote, why Tina Turner has a vote, why um, you know, um, John Mellencamp has a vote, why uh, Smokey Robinson has a vote, the idea is if they made their living in this art form, uh, achieved this level of success, they should be in the best position to judge the merits of their peers. So that's who votes. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, today at the City Club, we enjoyed a Friday forum with Greg Harris, President and CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.